Good morning. I'm sure you all are glad to be in the air conditioning this morning, having been outside. Those of you who are not here this morning and maybe haven't gone outside yet today, be advised that it's very hot out there. This may be the hottest day yet this year. Um, so everybody, I'm sure, is glad to be back in the air conditioning. This morning, we conclude our short series on the Old Testament book of Esther. You'll recall that the story takes place in Susa, which was one of the capital cities of the Persian Empire, and concerned six main characters. Ahasuerus, the king, Vashti, the queen, who, through her snub of the king, was deposed, Esther, the beautiful and comely Jewish girl, who was then crowned queen, Mordecai, Esther's cousin, who had taken her in as a child when her parents died, Haman, the prime minister who hated Jews in general, and Mordecai in particular, and the most important character of all, God, who in his infinite care preserved his people. The story is true, having taken place over a period of 10 or so years, beginning in 480 B.C. and concluded, concluding in 470 B.C., Ahasuerus was in moral debt to Mordecai because Mordecai had tipped him off to a palace assassination plot some years earlier, which had since been forgotten. When we left the story a few weeks ago, Haman had convinced the king that the Jews in the kingdom were a corrosive influence and had gotten him to issue an edict that on a certain date, nearly a year away, all the Jews were to be annihilated and their goods plundered. Mordecai was grief-stricken and urged Esther to intercede for her people, although she had up to that point hidden the fact that she was a Jew. After some frank and open discussions, as diplomats would say, she agreed to ask the king to save her people. She confronted the king, which was its own drama, and he agreed to attend a feast that day prepared by the queen for the king and for Haman. At the feast, she requested only that the two attend another feast the next day, and she promised to make her request then. Meanwhile, Haman's anger for Mordecai burned even hotter, and he had a gallows, which in Persia consisted of a pole upon which the unfortunate participant was impaled, a gallows erected, intending to ask the king to sentence the insolent Jew to death. But in the providence of God, that night the king had insomnia and asked that someone read to him from the book of the great deeds of the empire. The reader opened the book to the episode when Mordecai had warned of the assassination plot and the king realized that nothing had been done after that to reward him. He happened to ask Haman what would be an appropriate reward for someone the king wished to honor and Haman with his ego the size of Montana and thinking it was himself the king was consider, considering, responded with a laundry list of honors appropriate for such a person. Imagine Haman's dismay when the king directed him to bestow those honors on the hated Mordecai. Haman was forced to lead Mordecai through the city, shouting all the while, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. The solid edifice of Haman's world had begun to show cracks. After the tour of the city, Mordecai returned to his job, but Haman retreated, humiliated, to his home. And that is where we left the story a few weeks ago. Now, before we dive into the conclusion of the drama this morning, let's commit our time here to the Lord. Father, we come before you with, with the desire of being filled with your spirit this morning. Open your word for us. Allow us to drink deeply from it. Quench for us our spiritual thirst. Touch both our hearts and our minds with the words of life. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As before, I will note that I'm filling in part of the story where Scripture is silent, and my words, 
not being inspired by God are not entitled to the deference we show the actual text. But I believe my additions are consistent with, which, with what has been passed down to us in the writings. And while we're on the subject of writings, you may encounter other details of the Esther story that have also been handed down in writings. But there are writings and there is the canon of Scripture. Sometimes subsequent to the writing of the original text, extra chapters of Esther appeared and were included in the ancient Greek version of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. And those other passages are held as scripture by the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches today. Protestants have always deemed these extra chapters not the inspired word of God. Additionally, Jewish scholars over the centuries have written commentaries on all the Old Testament, and modern Jews revere those writings almost as scripture. We, of course, do not. And there are lots of other details of the Esther story that appear in those other sources. But because we do not consider those sources the inspired word of God, we have not considered them trustworthy and have thus ignored them in this series. So today, we open the book of Esther at chapter 7. And the narration has slowed way down as if the author is saying, hey, watch this. The first three chapters take place over nine years. Chapter four is perhaps a week, and five and six are two days. Most of chapter seven covers perhaps 15 or 20 minutes. And therein we find Ahasuerus and Haman attending the second feast thrown by Esther. Again, she did not disclose her request during the meal, but waited until Ahasuerus pressed her on it as the king and Haman relaxed afterwards. What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. The king was in a magnanimous mood. Things were going well. He had a full belly, a trusted second in command to keep things humming in the empire, and the prettiest woman ever for a wife. Life was good. But for Esther... Now is the moment of truth. She was about to pit herself against Haman, the most trusted and revered man in the empire, who no doubt was much older and much more politically savvy than she. No one got to his station in life without being ruthless to challengers who threatened him, as she was about to do. Would Ahasuerus' affection for her be enough to shield, from the, shield her from the inevitable blowback from Haman? Moreover, she had to be careful not to directly accuse the king, but to arouse his anger at the idea of the slaughter without emphasizing his involvement. Recall that the edict to destroy God's people went out using his signet ring. Lumping him in with Haman in the plot might give him reason to leave things as they were. Remember when Nathan the prophet confronted David over Bathsheba? He didn't come right out and accuse the king, but instead told him a story about two men, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had many flocks and herds, but the poor man had only one lamb that he had raised as if it were his own child. But when the rich man had a guest and wanted to throw a feast for him, Instead of using one of his many sheep, he took the poor man's lamb, slaughtered it, and fed it to his guest. The gross injustice of the story infuriated the king, of course, and he was very angry at the man. When Nathan declared that David was that rich man and that Uriah the Hittite was the man stolen from, he was immediately convicted of his sin. Esther would need a Hazoeris to have the same reaction. All eyes were fixed on her. She summoned her courage and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. 
If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. It's a safe bet that neither the king nor Haman knew exactly to what she referred at this point, but Haman must have felt the beginnings of unease. She had used the identical language to, that had been used in his kill all the Mordecai's people edict to destroy, to kill, to annihilate. Who were her people anyway? Upon hearing this, the king became indignant. Who is he and where is he who has dared to do this? That sounds a lot like David's reaction to Nathan. Who would dare do such a thing? And here we go, in the parlance of a sharpshooter, Esther is now locked and loaded and ready to fire. She squeezes the trigger and sends the bullet on its way. A foe, an enemy, this wicked Haman. And all the air leaves the room. And Haman has another deer-in-the-headlights moment. Wait, what? What? How did I wait? Surely the queen is not a Jew. The realization dawned on him that his crusade against God's people had an unintended consequence. The queen turned out to be one of the Jews that he had condemned to death. His orbit begins spiraling out of control. But look at the transformation we see in Esther here. No longer dependent merely upon her appearance, now she towers over the others in the court as representative and as mediator for God's people. Once she hid her connection to them, now she embraces that identity. Once she feared the repercussions of her heritage, now she boldly accuses the prime minister of threatening them out of existence. She is now at the height of her power, whereas Haman is in a tailspin. For his part, Ahasuerus got up from the table and stomped out into the garden. Think, think, think. Haman? The king no doubt knew that his punishing Haman would have blowback effects on himself. Haman was essentially running the empire for Pete's sake. Moreover, the edict that had been in the the king's edict, not Haman's, it went out under the king's seal. How could he have been so careless as to not inquire of the potential consequences? Now the king was forced to thread this needle very carefully. On the one hand, he adored the queen. And he could never stand for her to be caught up in one of Haman's schemes, even if he had been an unwitting accessory. But on the other hand, removing Haman would vastly complicate Ahasuerus' life. Who was waiting in the wings, capable of taking his place? This was not good. Back in the dining room, Haman was in full damage control mode. He had to somehow salvage this situation. He'd seen the rage in the king's eyes when he'd stomped from the room and instinctively knew that he was the object of that rage, not Esther. He threw himself on the couch where Esther is sitting and attempted to to beg forgiveness to explain that he had no idea she was a Jew. And now we have that scene that we see so often in the movies where two actors are in a compromising position, although innocent, and the third walks in at just the wrong moment and draws all the wrong conclusions. And so Ahasuerus bursts back into the room, sees Haman now sprawled on the same couch as Esther, and sees red. As I live and breathe. The audacity of the man who would attempt to assault the queen while I'm only steps away. Then again, he might just have handed me a reason to dispose of him. Will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? At once, 
The others in the room grabbed Haman and covered his face. It was now curtains for Haman, literally, and everyone in the room knew it. In an instant, Haman was transformed from the king's most trusted official into his most treasonous enemy. Gone were Ahasuerus' concerns about who would replace him in the government. This man was way out of line and had to be destroyed. And again, this is a good time to step back and think about the activities of that sixth character in this story. The one who is never explicitly mentioned, God. As we look at the totality of the goings-on here, can we entertain any doubts that this drama was shot through with the providence of God? Sometimes that providence is beyond our understanding. God used Esther in this moment to save her people. But using things both within her control and things outside of her control. It's within her control to muster the courage to confront Ahasuerus and request his attendance at her feast. But she had no control over his later insomnia, which led to the saving of Mordecai. If Mordecai had been executed, would she still have been able to host the king and Haman at the second feast later in the day? I don't think so. And that would have meant the opportunity of saving her people would have slipped through her grasp. The providence of God can be quite puzzling to us while in the moment. She hid her heritage from the king for over four years, which meant abandoning the laws of God. That was wrong. But was it right for her to do wrong? Of course not. It was wrong for her to do wrong. But God used that anyway. You see, God uses you and you and you and me and the billions of other people on this planet to accomplish his purposes. Are we intentional agents as we go through life? Are we exercising our will? Yes and yes. And yet God perfectly orchestrates what I'll call the times, which is to say the circumstances, the events, and the people to his divine purposes. God is not mentioned in this text. But isn't that a great comfort to us? We live in a world where, metaphorically, God isn't mentioned. He hasn't torn down the walls of any Jerichos lately. He hasn't recently sent ten plagues to assist in liberating his people. And yet, Just as within the book of Esther, God is at work, behind the scenes, as it were, accomplishing his will. As Nebuchadnezzar exclaimed after his seven-year lesson in Who is in Charge of the Earth, recorded in Daniel 4, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, What have you done? Nebuchadnezzar realized, as should we, that the ordering of life's events is a function of the sovereign will of God. It was true then. It's true now. Back to the story. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high. And the king said, hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that had been prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. Harbona hammers yet another nail in Haman's coffin. He reveals that Haman had intended to execute Mordecai, the very hero that the king had honored not 24 hours before. This is turning into a spectacular fail, a supernova, if you will, a star that explodes in titanic proportions. And then we have yet another ironic twist in this story filled with them. The very gallows that Haman had erected, had had intended to execute Mordecai on just the previous day, would now be used, used to boost Haman himself to his death. In Hamlet, Shakespeare called that being hoisted with his own petard. Prior to World War II, Robert Watson Watt, 
a Scottish weatherman, developed a method of using radio waves emitted by lightning to track thunderstorms. His success in that endeavor led him during the war to develop a method of using radio waves to detect distant objects, which was later perfected and known by the acronym RADAR. That system is credited with saving the Royal Air Force during the Battle of Britain, and he was knighted by the king as a result. But in 1956, while traveling in Canada, he was pulled over for speeding by a radar-toting policeman. And the irony was not lost on him. He later wrote a little ditty about it. Pity Sir Robert Watson Watt, strange target of this radar plot. And thus, with others I can mention, the victim of his own invention. His magical all-seeing eye enabled cloud-bound planes to fly. But now, by some ironic twist, it spots the speeding motorist and bites, no doubt, with legal wit, the hand that once created it. We laugh at the delicious irony of it and in the same spirit at the comeuppance of Haman. It's hard not to do so. Somehow, that hits us where we live. But interwoven through all the twists and turns of Esther's story, and indeed through all the twists and turns of our story, is the providence of God. It appears that Haman was saved from the further humiliation of learning that Esther was Mordecai's adopted daughter. The queen informed the king of that after Haman was lifted up. Perhaps to attempt making amends with his favorite wife, Ahasuerus gave Haman's household to Esther. And no doubt, with her encouragement, the king took the signet ring that he had given to Haman and gave it to Mordecai. Now, we might think this story has, all, has been wrapped up with a big bow now with the evil villain having gotten his just desserts, but we'd be wrong. The big issue remains unresolved. The edict condemning God's people to destruction is still out there, like a, like a torpedo honing in on its target even after the submarine that launched it has been sunk. Remember, a law of the Medes and the Persians cannot be countermanded. And this edict continued in effect. The date with destiny for God's people remained on the calendar. Now what? Esther again takes the lead, but notice the great contrast in her approach to the king. Where before she'd used stratagem and guile to play her hand, she now merely throws herself at the king's feet and weeps. Not the cool, collected chess player of before, but a wife seeking mercy. Please revoke the order for the annihilation of my people, the Jews. She's asking him to do the impossible, but her sentiments are entirely understandable. Paul expressed similar thoughts in Romans 9 about his kinsmen, the Jews, though with far greater ramifications. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. And we should feel the same burden for our relations who have not come to Christ. But the king seems to have no inclination other than to hand the issue to Mordecai, whom he directs to do as he will with respect to the Jews. Here we have a direct parallel to what the king had done with Haman and the original edict. Do what you will. And so Mordecai duplicated Haman's actions only in reverse. A new edict was issued, this time to God's people, authorizing them to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate any armed force of people that may attack them on that upcoming day and to plunder their goods. And like before, the edict was carried throughout the the empire to all the provinces. When the day arrived, God's people were triumphant over their enemies. Instead of being wiped from the earth, They struck their assailants with the sword, killing and destroying them, and even had the help of government officials because those fellows had grown very afraid of Mordecai's power, and no one wanted to oppose him. 
after the great victory the Jews celebrated, no doubt with a mixture of achievement and relief. Where previously they had feared the worst, ironically because of Mordecai's defiance of Haman, now they rejoiced over their victory made possible by Mordecai's triumph over Haman. In a book filled with ironic twists, this is the one with the most widespread participation. No doubt they quoted from Psalm 30 that day. You have turned for me my mourning now into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. Oh, Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. In fact, Mordecai decreed that Jews every year remember the victory over their enemies by celebrating the Feast of Purim, which means lots in Hebrew, calling to mind the lots that Haman consulted to determine the best day for the human slaughter to occur. And the Jews have celebrated that victory ever since. There are many takeaways from the book of Esther. The fact that God used Laman, not spiritual giants, through which to work his plan. Mordecai wasn't required to get formal education at seminary or Bible college in order to be useful to God. He was active in his secular job and was used by the Almighty right there. And so it is with us. The Lord works through every one of us, whether we're in full-time Christian work or not, and the Lord brings his harvest through us nonetheless. And what of Esther? She struggled with a dual identity just as we do. She hid her heritage at Mordecai's suggestion, pretending to be something she was not, only to reveal her true allegiance at crunch time. As Christians, we also struggle with a dual citizenship here on earth, our ultimate allegiance being to God, while citizens of a place that is increasingly anti-God. And how about her usefulness to God as a woman? One can look at many women in the Bible and come away with the impression that only through motherhood does a woman further God's kingdom. But Esther turns that idea on its head. Far from being marginalized because she didn't fit the mother profile, she was the central instrument God used to save his people. We've seen in the book of Esther how the hand of God worked all through the story using events large and small, using people, warts and all, using circumstances to accomplish his purpose. But what was his purpose? The saving of a rebellious people? The punishment of a wicked man? Yes and yes. But far greater still was his ultimate aim the manifestation of his plan for the ages, the story about which the entire Bible is concerned. God's ultimate purpose is the exaltation of Jesus Christ, his son. And in the book of Esther, we have a prototype of that. Let's take a look, a second look at chapter 8, verse 2. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman and gave it to Mordecai. And then down to verse 8, where Ahasuerus is speaking to Mordecai. But you may write as you please with regard to the Jews in the name of the king and seal it with the king's ring. For an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king, with the king's ring, cannot be revoked. And then down beginning at verse 15. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white, with a great golden crown and a robe of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. Do you see what has happened here? Mordecai has been exalted and given full authority over the empire, which at that time was most of the known world. That signet ring was the tangible symbol of sovereignty. It was used to establish, to, to put into effect laws and official decrees so one who wielded that ring did so with the force of the empire behind him 
And Mordecai was then dressed in the trappings of royalty which befitted his new station. He unleashed his forces and brought the enemies of his people to ruin. Who else does that sound like? Listen to what David wrote in Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. Of course, he writes about the Christ, the Messiah whom David prophesied would come and deliver his people. The Messiah that Jehovah exalted above all. Throughout the Old Testament, we have foreshadowings of that exaltation. Mordecai is one example. Another example is Joseph, whom Pharaoh established as ruler in Egypt. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him ride in his second chariot. And they called out before him, Bow the knee. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Both Joseph and Mordecai were raised far beyond their initial station. Joseph was thrown into a pit by his brothers, found himself in, sold into slavery, found himself in prison before being noticed and exalted by Pharaoh. Neither Joseph nor Mordecai sought out power or authority, but it was granted to them anyway in the providence of God. It's counterintuitive to us, but God takes the humble and uses them to his own glory. But no one in history humbled himself more than our Savior. Paul writes in Philippians that Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not, account, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. One cannot be raised up unless one is first low. The design that was formulated by the Godhead before the foundation of the world has Jesus glorified and Lord over all creation. But the plan first required that Jesus humble himself, that that he vacate for a time his seat in heaven and live among us and die among us. The plan conceived before time began had its low point in Genesis 3 with the fall of man and the triumph of Satan, but has its high point in Revelation with Christ properly seated on his throne. You see, the great story of the Bible is the exaltation of Christ Jesus articulated in the narrative of our redemption. His work on earth accomplished, God raised him up over all things. Paul explained this in Ephesians 1. The working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the, in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over the, all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is God the Father giving Jesus his due. It was his plan in the new covenant, and it was his plan in the old covenant. In Daniel 7, we have this. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. 
and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. Far from being a reaction to the circumstances of the moment, the exaltation of Christ is the predetermined plan of God. The ultimate aim of God's providence. Hazawaris' promotion of Mordecai as prime minister was purely a reaction to the flame out of Haman. And no doubt the king was selfishly looking out for his own interest and also pacifying Esther, his queen. But there is no such motive in the almighty glorifying Lord Jesus. His exaltation is the highest form of love. The just deserts for the beloved son in whom he is well pleased. Remember when Ahasuerus solicited advice from Haman on how to honor Mordecai? God the Father needed no advice on how to honor the man who is his favorite. Paul writes in Philippians 2, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And this is cause for our rejoicing. We who are joined with Christ delight in His exaltation because He is our kinsman. Yes, He's part of the Godhead but he is also fully human, having taken on flesh to save us. And as a result of his work on the cross, we are now joint heirs with him. So we shouldn't view his exaltation merely with detached bemusement. Oh, that's not for him. No. It's as if our closest brother were elevated to the highest post in the land and then double or triple that feeling. His success is our success. We bask as well in his glory. Moreover, we should rejoice in him because his mission is our mission. We are striving for the establishment of his kingdom. His victory will be our victory. Finally, we should rejoice because his exaltation is central to God's plan. The plan that is on track and on schedule and of which we have been privileged to see the end. God's plan ends with Christ seated on his throne and us glorified with him and reigning forever. We proclaim with the hymn writer, crown him of lords the Lord who over all doth reign who once on earth the incarnate word for ransom sinners slain, now lives in realms of light where saints with angels sing their songs before him day and night, their God, Redeemer, King. The question is not, why should we rejoice? But how can we not rejoice? How can we keep silent? The story in the book of Esther is a a microcosm of life. It has suspense, intrigue, despair, triumph, flavored with a dash of irony, just like life. But most importantly, the story in Esther mirrors life in the demonstrations of the providence of God. He did not abandon his people in that time, and he has not cast us adrift now. He hasn't left us to fend for ourselves. Again and again, he steers events to accomplish his purposes. And those purposes... The grand design of the cosmos, the the design formulated before the foundation of the world, has as its focal point the crowning of the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord of all. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank and praise you this morning for revealing yourself to us. 
for being active in history, for protecting your people and for your constant attention to our affairs. Help us to meditate on your faithfulness, on your your steadfast love for us. We thank you for the providence that you manifest in our lives. But most of all, we, we thank you for the exaltation of your Son and for our redemption through his blood. And now bless us as we leave this place. Keep us in the palm of your hand and And give us the peace that can only come from you. We ask all this in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. The meeting is dismissed.